Uh, you may be seated. Uh, we're uh, just really delighted that you are here this morning. Thank you, Brandon and the music team, again for the music and for tuning our spirits, our hearts, and our minds. How can we make sense of this pandemic and belief in a loving, all-powerful God? This novel coronavirus, or now COVID-19, was a, a virus that started, or is a virus that started in China, and then it made its way into Europe, and Italy uh, became the epicenter of the uh, virus uh, in Europe, and it spread to other countries. Finally, it spread to so many countries that it was, uh, by definition, a pandemic. It came to Canada, and the province of British Columbia uh, was an initial uh, uh, province that was impacted, and then, of course, Ontario and Quebec, and Quebec continues to be impacted by this, and other provinces as well, and here in southern Manitoba. People are sick. People are dying. We are told to shelter in, at, at our houses, to stay inside. Schools around the world and businesses are closed. And then uh, just recently, my parents were telling me that a missionary family, a young couple and their young children, all of them contracted COVID-19, the virus. So how do we make sense of this, of a pandemic, and also belief in a loving, all-powerful God? Questions are good. Questions are a, a form of excavating. It is a way of unearthing and discovery. It is a way of breaking the silence and opening up space if we let it, if we are willing to learn. And so this morning, let us consider even this question. What's really going on? We have in our life experience this COVID-19. It's very real. It's very present. But on the other hand, there is this proposition that there is a God. And not only is there a God, but He is loving and He is all-powerful. And so in our asking the question, we are identifying that there seems to be a problem. There is a conflict. How can the two possibly be true? And we know that COVID-19 is true. So how can the two be true? How can they coexist? And the next leading stage of that question is a conclusion can be drawn that God does not exist, or that God is not loving, or He is not all-powerful. And we hear uh, people respond to this line of questioning, particularly people who believe in God, who are Christians. And they will want to respond in different ways. Perhaps it is a response to uh, the pandemic itself, and people will say, well, the earth is sinful, uh, the, the earth is groaning. Others will uh, make a response in a form of defense of God. They may actually have a view of God and say that this is God's judgment, that He is, in fact, punishing the earth or punishing the world or punishing. Another Christian uh, response to this question is to say that God is allowing or permitting. But how do we make sense of it? How do you make a decision about what your response is? On what basis are you going to answer this question? What is the foundation? It reminds me of uh, being in an escape room. In an escape room, you 
are looking to try and move on to the next room. You're trying to get out of this predicament and it's complicated and it, it, it seems unsure. And what you're looking for is a key. You're looking for a key that's going to help you. But not only a key, there are these clues. But as you sort out the clues and you discover an answer, you also learn that there is a theme or a method to answering the questions, to finding the way. You're learning this key and this method. And so it is in this circumstance that we are in. That practice is called hermeneutics. It is a way of us understanding Scripture, but also a method, a way, a key to interpreting and understanding God and also our life experiences. That's what I want us to investigate this morning. And so I would ask that you pray with me as we explore this question. Heavenly Father, you are present here with us. And by your Spirit, you are present in the homes, in the houses, in the places where people have joined right now. You have promised that you will be with us, that you will not leave us, you will not forsake us. And you are here. And we ask you to illuminate the truths you have for us this morning. We ask, Lord, that we would be open to your Holy Spirit. Guide us and teach us and glorify yourself, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In about 60 A.D., there was another prominent person who was also in lockdown. The Apostle Paul was in lockdown in Rome. They called it house arrest. And he received a, a, a knock on the door. He had a visitor that came to him. His name was Epaphras. Now, Paul and Epaphras were friends. Epaphras had established a church in Colossae. And Epaphras was coming and made his journey over to see Paul because there were problems with the church in Colossae. They were in trouble. They were essentially under siege. They were being challenged, their very faith. And so the congregation was in upheaval. There was chaos. There was confusion. And so Epi was looking for some guidance and help from his friend Paul. So Paul and Epaphras, they talk, and then Paul agrees, and he writes a letter. It's his form of a video call or a live stream. But he decides in lockdown, he can't get there, so he writes what is the equivalent of uh, live streaming in the 21st century. He writes a document in 60 AD. Now, something you need to know about Paul is that uh, he had an extraordinary life. He had been, uh, they had tried to kill him at one point. They had, in fact, stoned him and thought he was dead, so they left. But he managed to live. On more than one occasion, he had been captured and had been beaten with 39 lashes. So when Paul is speaking and when he's writing, he's writing out of a, a life experience. Even now, locked down in Rome. So as he begins his letter, he opens up with a greeting. And then he goes in, after his greeting, he writes this in his letter to Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, 
the firstborn of the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. So just when we thought Paul would enter into his how-to lecture or give some fine do-it-yourself advice, Paul writes this. He begins after his opening by describing Jesus, by describing the Son of God. Paul starts with Jesus. The question of how for Paul begins with who. To put it another way, description precedes prescription. So for Paul, Jesus is the center. He is the center of Paul's hermeneutic. He is the key to answering the questions that are before us and before them. Jesus reveals what God is like. God is like Jesus. God, our creator, our heavenly father, is a spirit. He is invisible to our natural eye. But we do know and have heard about Jesus, and Jesus makes him known. But Paul gets even more refined in his response to this and in his description. As you'll see in verse 19 and 20. Through the blood of the cross. So for Paul, the cross is the pinnacle of God's essence and his action. The cross is God's how. Paul at one point says, in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, he says, I, For me, I have chosen to know nothing except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So Jesus is the key, and the cross is the carving of the key. It is the shape, the form of the key. It is the theme by which we come to understand and come to respond and make sense of the Bible, our approach to understanding what is happening in real life. So we can refer to the cross of Jesus Christ when it comes to making sense of this pandemic and a loving, all-powerful God. So we come to that question. The question reveals that we desire, that we need what is good. And we also acknowledge in the question that this pandemic is not. We acknowledge that sickness and death universally in every country around the world understands That is bad. And that to live is good. We understand universally, country upon country, that having a care and a concern for little children and babies, having a care and a concern for elderly people, having a care and concern for those who are particularly vulnerable in this circumstance, the homeless, people around the world recognize that that is good. But where does that sense of justice come from? It is not locked into a particular culture. It is not locked into a particular system or structure. Whether it is the country of China or Italy or South Korea or Germany or Canada. Where is this understanding and sense 
of justice and goodness coming from? It is coming from outside a culture. It is coming from outside our systems and structures. It is, in essence, a higher moral law. And it is a moral law that shows a kind of love, a kind of justice. And so the question actually underlines a sense and an existence of a higher moral law giver, the existence of God. But then we get more specific to the question of the COVID-19. And in these verses, we hear Paul say that all things were created by him and through him. So let's pause there for a moment. Did God make the iPhone? Did he make YouTube? Did God make that loaf of bread that you pulled out of the oven? Or that blueberry pie or those muffins or all that other baked stuff that we're seeing on Facebook? No. And neither did he make this pandemic. What scripture is showing us over and over again is that the creator, our God, is the creator of creation. He is the origin of all matter. And to kind of illustrate this, I think of a fire. There are these component parts of a fire. You have wood. You have oxygen. You even have the principle of friction. And so those are the component parts, and you can make a fire. But then you have, in cases, a fire where you can warm your hands. And you have a warm house in the middle of winter. You also have a fire that will burn a barn down and the animals in it. And so we can see that what is going on here is that there is this tension. Even when we ask this question, the the question is, can it be possible that good and bad can uh, exist at the same time? Can they both be true? Can God in this pandemic uh, coexist? Can there be both? As I've used the illustration of the fire, but I also want to draw out some words here. An antonym is an actual contradiction, like freedom and slavery. A paradox is the appearance of a contradiction that is, in fact, not contradictory. So, good and bad, love and evil, they do, in actuality, exist, even though there is this appearance of a contradiction. They exist in you and me. There are times when I am good. There are times when I am not. So we can understand that this conflict, this tension exists. But we also have one more part that Paul wrote about in verse 16. He says, by him and through him. But he also says, for him. This is created, creation is created for God. It gives us a sense of the purpose of creation. God's purpose, what it is for. It is for community, it is for relationship. It is meant and created for love and for reconciliation to be together. And so this pandemic is not fulfilling God's design and purpose. It is not for him. The cross of Jesus Christ can help us make sense of this. The cross of Jesus Christ helps us understand and gives us definition as to what is divine love. That he is for you and me and he is for this creation to such an extent that he would enter into it in order to rescue it. In John 3, 17, it says he came into this world not to condemn it, but to heal it. 
That's what divine love is. As we understand from the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ also informs us what is divine power. Humans equate power with force and coercion and violence. But the cross informs us what divine power is like. It is, in a word, it is with. It is a presence. It is being present with people. It is a a willingness to be humble and to attend, not to be coercive or forceful. A totally different way of bringing about change. It is invitational and welcoming. We're going to pause here. And have a time of question and response. Uh, A friend and mentor of mine, one of my virtual mentors, um, calls it Q&A. E-H. Uh, But we'll have a a moment here. I want to allow, give space for you to ask questions. And you can do that by um, text or email to SEMC, uh, ask at SEMConline.com. You can text or email ask at SEMConline.com. Or you can write um, your question in the comments on YouTube and uh, uh, Garth, Pastor Garth, is, is curating those, uh, that account, Ask, and he's also curating the comments account. He's just sitting over to my right here, and so uh, if you hear him saying something, he's telling me what, what the questions are. So uh, write your questions down, send them in. And Garth, have you got anything on there right now? So we're going to just pause for a moment. I'm going to take a little drink of water and give you a chance to ask your questions and then I will I will conclude with some a few few uh, few more comments remember the questions how good they are the excavating we won't belabor this because you can also send them in after the service and we will try and get to them uh, either during the week or during the next service. So if there's something that you have on your mind, and uh, I want you also to get a sense that this is something we'll be doing regularly, and so as you're watching and listening in the coming weeks, maybe you have questions, you write them down and, uh, while, while we're in the service. We're in a little bit of a delay. Okay. Okay. So there is a slight delay, as Garth is saying, in terms of our live uh, feed here and what you're getting at home. Yeah. So with this pandemic, is this uh, God's way of punishing us? Right. So is this God's way of punishing us? And uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, Is this God's way of punishing us or is this God's judgment on us? By now, you've heard me say how I go about making sense and responding to this and to other questions. By looking to the cross of Jesus Christ. And so what I see at the cross, where is the Lord located? He is on the cross. It was uh, human anger, human violence that was acted upon Jesus. He absorbed the punishment. He absorbed the judgment. And then ultimately he defeated it. So that is what God is like. And so I would like to say to you, as directly as I can that this is not God's judgment on the earth or on humankind. Maybe you have a follow-up question. 
sometimes I, I wonder if I don't answer directly enough. So I chose there to just go ahead and uh, sometimes the direct answer can just seem kind of short and f the conversation is finished. Uh, but I hope that that's helpful. I've heard this one a lot. Why doesn't God get rid of the virus? Right. Why doesn't God get rid of the virus? So that's another good question. And, and I, it, again, it, it breaks the silence. It's something that we wonder. And the, what's behind that is, like, what are we assuming or how would we like God to get rid of the virus? Uh, would we like there to be some form of miraculous uh, uh, intervention of some kind? But what would that actually look like? Uh, how would that actually take place? What I wonder is, is it possible that God is working to eradicate this virus through people, through science, through various ways? Maybe it is not in the timing that we like. And yes, uh, there are deaths. And death is an enemy. It isn't God's favor. And so the question of why he doesn't end it, I think what I want to ask is, is he already working in that direction? And maybe the expectation of a, a sort of an arm reaching down from the sky is not the way he works. Certainly not typically. But that he's already working. And what I wonder is something that I have observed, and we're going to talk about this more next week, is that there is extraordinary results that come out of very difficult times. And this is one of them, where there is all kinds of beauty that is coming up out of these ashes. And so I believe he is working towards ending this virus. I believe that. Maybe we will pause it there for now. If you have other questions, please send them in. I want to finish by just saying a few things here in, in closing. What do we do when we have this information? One of the things that Jesus said, Kimberly, my wife and I were talking about this, and she pointed out something that, that really struck me that I hadn't observed before. When Jesus said, if anyone wants to come after me, let them deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. And this aspect that now this is yours. <laughs> now it is yours. You have the key. You have the hermeneutic. You, you understand you have the cross of Jesus Christ. Now take up your cross and apply this. Embody this. Embody this Approach, embody the good news. Not condemn, not defend God somehow by making excuses for God or even pronouncing judgment or punishment on a world that God has already said He is not doing. But embodying the good news. And the who, that is Jesus, shows us how. So we come back to the illustration of the fire. In this time, when we feel to varying degrees like the house is on fire, we know that that is not for our God. That is not the purpose He has in mind. And we know that He then enters in and He helps and He gets involved. And so followers of Jesus Christ, so can we. That is our invitation. That is what we are called to do. Next Sunday, we are going to get another layer of practicality when we explore this question, how can we cope with our pandemic emotions? And I've heard from many of you and read the 
kinds of emotions that we are experiencing right now. And next week, we will explore how we cope with our emotions amidst this pandemic. Jason.